want to see your face show me your face Lord fill this place fill this place fill this place Lord we come to see Come, Holy Spirit, you're my desire. Come, Holy Spirit, won't you set me on fire? Won't you come, Holy Spirit? Won't you breathe your life in me? In me. Come, Holy Spirit. Will you say it with me? You're my desire. Come, Holy Spirit. Won't you? set me on fire come Holy Spirit say it again won't you come sweet spirit we want you to come Holy Spirit Your sweet life again in me. Cause you're healing the hurts of my past. Grace that brings freedom to life. Cause you're healing the hurts of my past. Oh, you're healing the hurts of my past. So one more time I say, come Holy Spirit. You're my desire. Sweet Spirit, won't you set me on fire? Come, Holy Spirit. When you breathe your life, won't you come, Sweet Spirit, blow your sweet wind, change my life, won't you come, Holy Spirit? Breathe your life. Breathe your life, breathe your life. I gotta have your spirit life to rule over everything. I don't want to be living in my own self. I don't want to be, I don't want to be just like everyone else. No, no, I want, I want your spirit life to breathe. I want your spirit life in me. I want all of you and less of me. Let him heal you right now. Because you're healing the hurts of my past. Say it one more time. Because you healed every wound in my past. You know, he did it for me. Healing every
every wound. When I went through divorce as a young kid, it just rocked my world. But the Holy Spirit came on me one day and he took me through my whole life. Every memory he healed. And that's why Jesus, Yeshua, when he saw Thomas, he said, put your hand, put your hand in my side, put your hand with the nails, pierce my, hand, pierce my hands, put your hands with the nails, pierce my feet. You say, Pastor, why are you saying it like that? Because when you could talk about the places that you were wounded, and you say, you can touch them now. You can touch them. Once you can touch them now, and it doesn't hurt anymore, that's when you know you're really healed. Oh, yes, Lord, because you healed every wound of our past. You gave us grace that brings freedom to last. And your presence will cause me to dance again. You're going to cause me to dance again. I feel the Holy Spirit saying, won't you let me come in? Won't you let me move? Won't you let me come in and change all of you? Won't you let me come in? I've got so much more to give to you. Oh, yes, he does. Just lift your hands and say it one more time with me. Come, Holy Spirit, I'm going to let you in. You're my desire. Come, Holy Spirit. I need your fresh fire. Come, Holy Spirit. Breathe your life. Breathe your life. Breathe your life in me. Breathe your life in me. You receive that. You receive that. I, I, I can stay on here all day, but if I do, you're going to all be in trouble. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So you understand, that's, that's, we're not, we don't, this is not a show, right? You know, the Lord's been dealing with us about preparing, as we count the, you know, the days to Shavuot. We are in a very prophetic season. And there's a sound that was released on Shavuot or Pentecost. You know that there was a sound. And, and today what I want to talk to you about is uh, the mysteries of the shofar, the mysteries of the shofar sound. Because there's something I want you to understand about the shofar. It's, first of all, we can blow the shofar here on earth. And when you blow the shofar, two things happen. Wind creates a sound that is released through that shofar. There's, so there's two things that happen so simultaneously when you blow the shofar. You are releasing wind, and at the same time as you release wind, there is a sound. You cannot separate the wind from the sound. Now, well, when you think about this, all throughout the Bible, both testaments, God 
gives instructions about the shofar, about the, the trumpet, if you will. It's very powerful because it's a weapon, because it's also a way for Israel to be directed whether they're going to go forward, it would be used that we know we use, they use the shofars to announce special days such as the, the new moons. It says to, to blow the shofars on your festivals, on your happy days, and even the solemn days, there's the release of that shofar sound. If you've been studying with us, and I hope you, I, I just encourage you, go back at least four or five weeks and listen to every Shabbat service and even the Zooms that we've done because there's been a lot of teaching on Shavuot and preparing for Shavuot and understanding this counting time that we're in. The first shofar in the Bible is not man blowing it. It's God blowing it, and it's in Exodus 19, and two times, the fir it's the first mentioned in two times, the shofar, and it says two things about it. It says, the shofar had a voice, and it said, the shofar walked. So the first mention of the shofar, it has a voice and it walks. And literally the shofar is bringing us back to the Garden of Eden where they heard the voice of God walking in the garden. Acts chapter 2, you have the same thing. Remember the shofar, there's two things happening at the same time. There's, a, there's wind and there's voice. So what happened to Acts chapter 2? And suddenly there came a sound, a voice, like as of what? A, mush, a mighty rushing wind. Both instances, Exodus 19 and Acts chapter 2, there is not a man blowing the shofar. It is God's shofar. I had this epiphany. I don't can't say that I can um, give you all the understanding or scriptures about it. But I believe when the Lord comes back, he's going to blow that shofar. And we are going to hear a sound. But we're also going to ride on the wind of that shofar. And to me, that shofar, when he blows it, when he's going to return... It is going to be for those who believe, for those who are the bride of Messiah, I believe we are going to step into a heavenly supernatural portal that's created by the sound and the wind of the shofar. So, I've never taught on the shofar. I know, Jeremiah, you have great understanding and teaching at the shofar. Um, uh, uh, Irene, I know. So you might want to blow the shofars that when I get to that part of the sermon, or if you want to come and tell me some things later that I've forgotten because um, I'm only going to give you just some understanding of the shofar in relationship to what I believe God is doing right now. So again, let me say this. God is the originator of the shofar blowing. But what I love about God, he wants us to join with him in the shofar blowing. I'm going to tell you right now, every person here needs to get a shofar. Now, we're going to Israel. Don't give us your money and tell us to go get you a shofar because literally we have... Limited space with my wife's shopping abilities in. And thank you for not filling up my water, but if somebody could fill this up. I, I have this beautiful glass, but it's empty. Lord, let it not be prophetic. <laughs> let my glass be full. <laughs> Lord, fill my cup. <laughs> let it overflow. So, there's many other times in the scriptures where the Lord would use the shofar and he would tell the people to use the shofar as a weapon in a way that I'm going to command you um, to use it. In Jericho, just remember that Jericho was the first city Israel con 
conquered. When the shofars were blown in unison, everybody say in unison. There's something about this. In unison, with a shout, the shofars were blown, and Israel made the shout together. Israel, who circled around Jericho for seven days, ascended. They went up to possess the first city in the promised land. Again, the people were in unison. All the walls representing fortified strongholds fell down as the people went up in victory. So I believe that part of the weaponry of the shofar can bring strongholds down, can cause those fortifications of the enemy that, that have, that is, Walls of resistance, walls of rebellion, walls saying, you're not going to get here. You're not going to cross over. I believe those walls can and should come down. Do you agree? So when Gideon, by God's command, went down with or to three companies, he only had, he started with 32,000. He ends up with three. 300 men divided into three companies of 100 each, and each of those men had to learn how to drink hand to mouth. And all that's telling you is you have to be able to receive from the fivefold ministry. You have to be able to drink from an apostle, prophet, evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. You have to be able to say, you can't say, I'm only going to get it directly from God. God has mouthpieces, He has different vessels. And when He appoints those vessels to be in your life, you've got to be able to drink from them, from their, from, from, from your hand, from, uh, from, that, from that word that's coming from them. The strategy was they would have a shofar in one hand and in the other hand they would have a, a light or a torch covered by a clay vessel. And then when, when the command was given, the sword of the, you're going to say the sword of the Lord in Gideon, you're going to take that trumpet, that shofar, and you're going to shatter the clay. And oh, what is that telling you? The power of the shofar has the power to break down the flesh, power to break down the, the things that are man-made, the dust, the clay. Broken vessels of light, when we're broken, when, when the Lord is allowed to go into those places in our life that is in the darkness and the light shines through them, wow. Wow. Things happen, but we don't want God to go. But but the shofar seems to help with that. So the shofar, it wasn't used to to it was used to break the flesh by smacking it. I never thought about this as like a I, I know it blow through, but I never thought about using the shofar just to beat somebody over the head. No, no. <laughs> Pow. Some of you guys might want to use that. I don't know. My hard headed what <laughs> But when they blew the shofar, they had circled around the city for six days, right, once each time. Then on the seventh day, you have seven priests bearing seven shofars, seven days. You know, you, you see it's like the, the seven shofars or the seven priests going around the city seven times. That's like... 49 revolutions. That's, that's very similar to our counting towards Shavuot. You count 49 to 50 and boom, you, you know, the walls come down. So the walls came down with the sound of the shofar and the people also ascended. They went higher. Everybody say, it's time to go higher. I believe the shofar call, especially at Shavuot, is a call to ascend. God wants you to ascend. He wants you to move out of what you're what you're comfortable with in the flesh, I believe what God is moving this congregation to is you're going to start being uncomfortable in the flesh and you're going to become comfortable in the spirit. And that was a word that God gave me when I was praying. He said, we're going to become uncomfortable in the natural or in the flesh, but we're going to only become comfortable in the spirit. Now, we're not used to that because the enemy has made sure in this beastly system that we're very comfortable in things that we shouldn't be comfortable with. We'll get to that later. 
I'll give you my study notes, but the first, where does the shofar come from? The shofar, the first mention is in Exodus, but what is that shofar? That shofar is a ram's horn, and the ram's horn goes back to the day that Abraham was bringing his son Isaac to be offered as an ola, as an ascension offering to the Lord. And what happened? They walked together, right? They walked because the father and the son walk as one, right? They walked in, in unity. And then Isaac got the smarts. He said, you know, I see the fire, I, I, I see the wood, um, you tied me up. Um, where, where is the, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says the Lord, prophetically, he says the Lord's going to provide a lamb. There wasn't a lamb that day, but he was prophesying of Yeshua in the future, right? He was prophesying of the lamb of God that would be slain before the foundation, of, that was slain before the foundation of the world, but it would give his life. But what they did, what did happen is immediately Abraham turned his head and he saw a ram caught by its horns. The horns of that ram are what? A shofar. The true shofar in the Bible is not this kind of horn. It's actually, the one, I had it last week, it's actually the, a smaller horn. It's a ram's horn. And the rabbis understood, and the Midrash understands, that that ram's horn is prophetic of Messiah's coming. Let me just read it to you. I don't usually read a Midrash, but let me just read this to you. I thought it was interesting, and then we're going to go really fast. It says, the Midrash claims that the two horns of the ram became the two trumpets of God. The Holy One, blessed be He, He blew the first shofar trumpet at Mount Sinai on the occasion of the giving of the Torah as is described in Exodus 19. Look what He says. He will sound the second one to herald the coming of Messiah. Oh, I love it. The shofar blown at Mount Sinai when the Torah was given came from the ram which had been sacrificed in place of Isaac. The Lord shall provide, right? The left horn was blown for a shofar at Mount Sinai, and its right horn will be blown to herald the coming of Messiah. The right horn was larger than the left, and thus concerning the days of Messiah, it's written in Isaiah 27, 13, on that day a great shofar will be blown. Who's blowing it? It's the Lord. Rabbi says, objected, he objects to this interpretation, because this is what he says, was not the ram burnt as a burnt offering together with his horn, skin, and flesh, which means there's nothing left. How could this be the source of the shofar that was blown on Mount Sinai? He went on to answer his own question, saying the answer is that God created a new ram out of the ashes. How can the horn from Isaac's ram be the same horn that will herald the coming of Messiah if that ram was completely burned? God resurrected the ram. Listen, these guys don't know Yeshua, but in their writings, everything points to Messiah. So you get this shofar blowing in the book of Revelation. And look in Revelation. God is calling John to do what I'm, I believe God is calling all of us to do. If you're in service today, there's one reason you're here. God wants you to go higher. Jo Revelation 1.10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying. Wow, this is amazing. I heard the voice. It was like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a scroll and send it. John on Shabbat was in the Spirit. He was comfortable in the Spirit. Then he heard a great voice that he describes as a trumpet or a shofar. And the scripture says, whatever you see, when you're in the spirit, you're going to see things. You're going to hear things. When you see, write it down for the seven congregations or assemblies. We know that word assemblies, most of our, if you read a, many translations that don't have this understanding, they will say the seven churches. But the word in the Greek is ecclesia, and ecclesia is, is um, a cognate to the Hallel 
gathering or assembly word of Israel. Israel was a congregation. Israel was an assembled people. So the ecclesia in the New Testament is the same equal expression to the gathering of God's people as a congregation in the Old Testament. And I'm not going to make my make that point because most of you understand that the what we say is the church and that the church is something new it's not at all it existed from Exodus 19 when he gathered the congregation at Mount Sinai to hear the first jubilee sound the first shofar sound look look, look so just real quick, I'm just going to read part of this verse. Look in Revelation 4. After these things I looked and behold, look at this. Oh, this is so good. A door. Everybody say a door. Who's the door? A door was standing. I'm about to get happy. Is it a closed door? What, what is the door that God has for us? It's an open door. And it's in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking with me, like a trumpet said, look what he says. Come up here. Ascend higher. Hear the sound of the trumpet. I was in this. Come up here. I will show you what must take place after these things. Does that sound to you a lot like John uh, chapter 14 through 16 where Yeshua says I'm going away but it's okay because I'm going to send the spirit and when the spirit comes he's going to show you things to come if you want to know what's going on you've got to get uncomfortable in the flesh and get comfortable in the spirit because you're not coming up higher in the flesh you're going to only go up higher in the spirit and then he's going to show you Can keep reading it keeps says i was in the spirit i was in the spirit revelation one says i turned around to see who was speaking to me and when i had turned i saw seven golden menorahs among the golden the menorahs was someone like the son of man wearing a robe to his feet gold man around his chest we, at the very end of that look in the look in the last part look in verse at the end of look in verse 18 the living one i was dead but look i'm alive forever and ever i hold the keys who holds the keys of death and soul yeshua does so write down again he's telling the same thing write down what you see but what is now and what will happen afterwards if you look at that scripture in revelation 1 it says john turned to see a voice last time i checked you don't turn to see a voice you learn to you turn to see some form some but if you get if if you understand that john is basically relating to you exactly what moses did in exodus chapter 3 when moses went up to the Mount Sinai, and he turned to see the voice speaking in the midst of the fire. It's the same thing. What if God wants you to be more familiar with the voice or the sound than what you actually see with your eyes? What if we need to hear first and then see, rather than see first and then decide if I'll listen? Seven times in the book of Revelation, it doesn't say, see what the Spirit is saying. It says, hear what the Spirit is saying. But we don't want to hear. We want, show it to me. You... And it's not the pattern. It's not the model. Israel at the mountain, they said, we will hear first. Then they'll see. Then you'll understand. Look in Revelation 2. I have this against you, that you have forsaken your first love. Remember then from where you've fallen. Repent, do the deeds you did at first. If not, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to remove your menorah out of its place unless you repent. I have this thing against you. I have this thing, go uh, excuse me, yet you have this going for you. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans was all about the mixture, mixing God's holidays with 
the pagan holidays. And, I, and Ephesians, the, the congregation of Ephesus, they did not mix. They knew that there's some things you could not be a part of. Even though what we've, we've been watching a lot of stories of, uh, of things that happened in, in Nazi Germany and all those things. That once you say, I can't be a part of this popular society, I'm also cutting off my access to finances and business contacts. Because, I, because the parties weren't just about parties. You'd worship their God, but that's where you do business. But an Israelite couldn't do that. Someone following Messiah couldn't do that. So he says, you got that going. But look what he says. He says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. See, we don't hate yet the world. We still like it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to Messiah's communities. The one who overcomes, amen, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You'll see over and over in the book of Revelation, God saying, hear what the Spirit is saying. He comes to every congregation and he tells them, I like this, I don't like that. Look in verse 24 of Revelation. I'll just skip down for time's sake because I, I, I don't want to mess up and not get to the root of this message. Revelation 2, look in verse 24. But to the rest of the community in Thyatira, Thyatira is the fourth congregation, and they are parallel to the feast of Shavuot. Shavuot is the fourth feast. Fourth feast on this menorah. One, two, three, four. So every one of the seven congregations, you can, and I, we, we don't have the graphic for you today, but you can put the name of the congregation over the seven candlesticks of the menorah, and every, the Ephesus is going to point to Passover. Uh, Smyrna is going to point to the, the resurrection of uh, the, the, the fruitfulness in, of giving of the first fruits at Bikarim, uh, of, excuse me, of the first fruits. Every one, if you just put, you can, every one of these seven congregations are going to help you understand the feast days better. I think we're going to have to have a class, Natalie, on this. Hurry up, Natalie. It's called the creation gospel. We're going to teach it. You got to learn it. But look at, so he says, Thyatira, you don't hold to this teaching, which was Jezebel, and have not learned the so-called deep things of Satan. I have placed on you no other burden, only hold firm. Look what he says. This is, this is, we're Shavuot, right? We're in Shavuot. What do we got to do? Only hold firm to what you got to hold it until he comes. The one who overcomes and guards my deeds until the end. This is the time the enemy wants to get you to hear static, to get off your game, to get off the, the rhythm, the cadence that God has for you. You're going to learn about this on Thursday night if you watch the New Moon teaching. It's gonna, you're going you're gonna to love it. Pastor Lisa did an amazing teaching on Thursday for, for, the, for the New Moon. You've got to listen to it. So this is the time you've got to hold on. And what happens? To the one who overcomes and guards my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. What did God give in Acts chapter 2? He gave, him, gave the people the authority of the Spirit. What did he give Israel in Exodus 19? He gave Israel the authority of the Torah, the Word of God. So this is our time for authority. He, but you've got to hold on and don't lose what you have. I'll give you authority over the nations. He'll rule them with a rod and iron. As when clay pots are broken into pieces. Wow, that sounds like, that sounds like Gideon. Pow! Break those, break those pots so the light can show. Even as I receive from my Father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to Messiah's community. So are we hearing what the Spirit is saying. But let me get personal with you. Let me get in your business or let the Lord get in your business for just a moment. After all, this is our house. We're allowed to do this. You came to our house. You might not come back, but you're here now. 
but I don't believe that. Are you hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying to this congregation? See, this is something we don't realize. When the Holy Spirit speaks, he's not speaking to you as an individual. He's speaking to all of us as a people, as a congregation, because we work together. And what one person does affects somebody else. And you can be a blessing to somebody, but you also can hurt somebody. I believe the Lord wants some strongholds and fortified walls to come down like he did at Jericho. And I believe he wants to do it today. The spirit sound that was released was so great. The barriers of resistance, no matter how thick and high they were, could not stand up against the shofar. You type in walls of Jericho and uh, do a search and Look at all the different understandings of how high those walls were, of how thick those walls were, and how Israel, when they saw those walls in the natural, it looked like it was impossible. Have you ever felt like Israel, that there's some resistance walls that are so high, that are so thick, how am I ever going to get through? How am I going to ascend when I got this giant wall? And I don't know about you, but the closer you get to your purpose and destiny in life, it seems like you hadn't heard or saw, thought of that wall for so long. But the moment you start walking forward into what God has for you, all of a sudden it's like, here's that wall again. So let's look at the backstory of Jericho. Excuse me, uh, this, is not, uh, this, is, this, is, um, this is not the story of Jericho. This is the story of Gideon. Look in Judges 6. Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the Israelites cried out for the Lord for help. And it came about when they cried to the Lord because of Midian. The, look, oh, this is, this is bad. How dare the Lord just do this? I'm crying out for help, and you're going you're gonna to bring me up on charges? Lord, just, just help me. I don't want to know what I did wrong. I don't want to know about the open door. Just, just fix it. And the Lord sends a prophet. They're crying out for help. He sends a word, a prophet to the Israelites, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you out of the house of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all that oppressed you. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. And I said, I'm the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose you live, but you have not Really? Pastor, don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. Just pat me on the back and send me out with a blessing. Put the communion in my mouth. Let's go. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear, but you've not listened or obeyed my, you didn't do what the Lord told you to do. You didn't follow my, my mitzvahs. You didn't do my decrees. You didn't keep Shabbats. You, you were too busy. You wanted to be like the nations. Look in Judges 6.34. Gideon has this encounter with an angel. And it says, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And look what he does immediately. And he blew a shofar, a trumpet, and Abiezer, his family, was gathered to him. Wow. God's beginning to move. And when God's beginning to move, God begins to Give Gideon strategy. And the first strategy is you got to have the spirit. And then when you have the spirit, then you're going to take that shofar. And you're going to release the wind. You're going to release the sound. And something's going to happen. And when the sound of the shofar was, was released, you know who the first people that came to Gideon's side? His family. You can look at it, it's very plain. He came from this family that was gathered to him. Have you ever felt like your family's not with you? 
Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just get your peeps, your family with you? Don't you feel like if you could just get your family with you, my goodness, we, could, we can rock the We thought about this. If we could just get all the giftings in our family to work together. Now, some of you have such a big family, you can fill the whole church up. You know that. And the name of his family, the Abiz, the Abiz, Abiz rites, the Abiz right, literally means my father is help. That's got to be prophetic. That's got to be prophetic of saying, hey, Gideon, it's not just your family coming alongside of you. It's prophecy that the Father is your help. The Father's going to come when you blow this shofar. The root word for the name Gideon is Gada. And Gideon's name means, you can look it up, to fell a tree, generally to destroy anything, to cut asunder, in sunder, to cut down, to cut off, or to hew down. And you can see that Gideon actually goes and he cuts down his father's idols. The spirit that was on Gideon, he lived his name. His name meant to cut off, to cut down. And in Judges 6, you can see that Gideon goes by night, right? And he, 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 look at it, look, I'll read it. Came to pass that night that Adonai said to him, take the young bull that belongs to your father and a second bull of seven years old. Pull down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father. Cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Man, you, you got yeah, this is, this is Elijah with the prophets of, of Baal and Asherah. I mean, you got the two joined together. And Louis says, build an altar to Adonai your God on the top of the stronghold in an ordinary manner. Where is he going to build that altar? When he cuts down the stronghold of the altar of Baal and Asherah, then he's going to build a new altar to the Lord on the same place. But the key is you can't build the new altar until you cut down. Maybe the reason we can't build what God wants to build in our life is we haven't first taken down the devils that our father refused to pull down. And as long as we're okay, as long as we're comfortable with Baal and Astra being at the top of the mountain instead of out of Noi. But what if you decide I'm in a season that I'm going to get everything God has for me. I'm going up higher and that means for me to build what God wants me to build, I'm going to have to cut down some things. That I've been comfortable with, even in my house. It's okay. Nobody knows. It's in that room. But it's a demon. But it's art. What they call art today is scary. I mean, little Yael is an amazing artist. She's less than two years old. I would much rather frame her artwork. Looking at 2 Corinthians 10, are you getting anything out of this? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful through, through, through God. For the tearing down of strongholds, those fortified places. We are tearing down false arguments. Remember, what is a lie? It's... Forget it. <laughs> I went blank. We are tearing down false arguments and every high-minded thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. Ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. I didn't come up with this, but, but a lie is an excuse wrapped up in the skin of a reason. A lie is an excuse wrapped up in the skin of a reason. Yes, that, that sounds like something Jerry Seinfeld would say. But it's not. So 
Strongholds can come down. They've got to come down. We are waging war right now in the spirit. I don't believe my whole life I've ever felt so much oppression, depression, demonic activity and it started last Shabbat in the service there were so many people bound back problems bowed down depression somebody just said flat out I need deliverance I mean they didn't even play with us Is anybody, am I the only one that sensed a little more demonic activity than usual? Does anybody, is it just us? Maybe it's just, maybe not, maybe you, you're, thank God. I don't want you to have to deal with it. So let me give you a definition of strongholds. Strongholds are layered fortifications anchored in fleshly, soul-driven attachment to the lies, distortions, deceptions, and demonic influences. Write it down. Take a screenshot. Strongholds are layered fortification. You're, here's what you don't understand, or maybe you do understand, but let me just tell you it again. A stronghold is not coming down with one blow by you. Now, if God gets behind it, yes. But strongholds are layered, which means you have to deal with each layer of the lie. The untruths, the distortions, and they're fleshly, they're soul-driven attachments. So you're, you're bound in more than one way. Your body, your mind have come into agreement. And they don't want you to bring these strongholds down. Because they make you feel secure. They make you, this is your go-to. This is why people are spending, now not you, because you're not going to spend your money on it. But there is a lot of people that will spend a lifetime sitting and talking to somebody who will never get to the root of the strongholds. They might scratch a thin layer off, maybe. But they're, you got to understand, they can't afford to let you get free. And they don't understand that what you're going through is not just in your mind. It's not just something that happened to you in your body, but it's spiritual. And they're not equipped for that, unless it's a you know, Christian base, and there is some that are. So what happens to you does not have to define and continue to control you. It, it, it happened to you, but it doesn't have to define you. It doesn't have, have to continue to control you. Now, if you don't know what I'm teaching today, or let me just say it like this. Every feast day, will be an opportunity for the enemy to begin to bring back many of the things you've dealt with in your past and you said, I thought I got free of it. I, I, I didn't thought about this, but the enemy works the hardest on the appointed times because he wants to get you off God's calendar. He wants to sit on the, the, the Moedim. He wants to control you. And he wants to pull you right back down. So dealing with these soul-driven issues is quite messy. Can somebody say amen to that? And it makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to just, like I said, just give me a nice little prayer.
But we've got to be uncomfortable in the natural and comfortable in the spirit. Galatians 5 says, we live by the spirit, let us walk by the spirit. Now one of the strongholds that the enemy will use more than any other, I believe, is unforgiveness. Because when you have unforgiveness, you will not get free. Look in 2 Corinthians 2. Now if any, if now anyone you forgive, I also forgive. For indeed, what if I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything? I did it for you in the presence of Messiah, so that we, if I say we, I forgive. It didn't happen to me. It happened, but I just forgive him. If, if, they, if they did something wrong, I'm with you. We release them. We exhale. We forgive them. Because we, so we might not be outwitted by Satan, for we, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. It, you've got to release forgiveness and it has nothing to do with if you feel forgiveness. You release it by faith. Say, Father, I forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing, even though in your mind you think, but they really knew. If they really knew how much they hurt me. And if you would get this in your mind, they don't really know because all they're thinking about is themselves, just like you. So exhale, which is forgiveness, <sighs> breathe out that toxic air, let them go, because if you don't, Satan has a scheme to keep you in bondage. And if you're not moving forward, I guarantee you, you're also keeping somebody else from moving forward. Look in Matthew 5. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering to the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, which, which tells you, look at the word verbiage. Not that you have something against somebody else. You, there's somebody that has an issue with you. And you're like, I didn't do anything. I don't, know why they, I don't know why they feel like that. I did for them what I did for everybody else. Can you relate? But they still have an issue, right? Now look what the Bible says. You remember your brother has something against you. Stop praying. Stop giving your offering until leave your offering before the altar. He said, he said I like that part. Leave your offering there before the altar. But you got to go home. Go back and be reconciled to your brother. And then come present your offering. Wow. What if our offerings aren't even producing what they would produce because we have unforgiveness? Or we're, we're, not being, we're not reconciling to somebody when we can. Is this making you uncomfortable? I want you to get uncomfortable with living with unforgiveness. I want you to get uncomfortable with, with living with people that don't like you and have something. I want you to be uncomfortable with it so much that you make an effort to reconcile. Even when you say, I don't know. what I didn't do anything. What me? Now back to Gideon. Look in Judges 7. Then the townspeople said to Josh, bring your son. He's got, he needs to die. He has broken the altar of Baal. He's cut down the astral pole that was beside it. And Joshua, Josh said to all that stood behind, behind, against him, you're going to defend Baal. You're going to rescue him. Whoever descends him will be put, defends him will be put, to, him to, will be put to death in the morning. If he's God, let him defend himself since someone has broken down his altar. So on that day he was called Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal contend with him since he broke down his altar. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east gathered together, crossed over, and camped in the valley of Jezreel. The moment Gideon took the stronghold out, he took down those high places, the high altars. That's when the Midianites and the Amalekites joined forces in the valley of Jezreel to finish Israel off, but the opposite happened. 
The removal of those idols and spiritual strongholds was going to be the end of Israel's enemies. Maybe because we've not thought about getting to the root, we've not seen the victory that God wants to bring into our lives. So what God does, he encourages Gideon with a prophetic dream before he goes into battle. And look what happens in Judges 7. It came to pass that night, Adonai said to him, Arise, get down to the camp, I've given it to your hand. That's the word of the Lord. I like that. But if you're afraid to go down, go to the camp with your attendant Pura, then you will hear what they're saying, and after that your hands will be strengthened to attack the camp. Notice, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear it. So he went down with the attendant Pura to the outpost of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were countless, as numerous as the sand of the sea. This is what happens when you go after the enemy's stronghold. He's going to show up. Verse 13, yet when Gideon came, behold, there's a man relating a dream to his fellow, saying, listen, I just now had a dream. When did he have the dream? Just now. When was that? After they gathered together, after Gideon took the strongholds down. Listen, I had a dream. There's a loaf of barley bread. What season is barley representing? It's in the season between Passover and Shavuot. We're in the season right now. There's no wheat harvest until Shavuot. We're in barley. And he sees a loaf. What does a loaf represent? It's the loaf represents people who have been baked together in the fire of affliction and have become one. Until you're baked together with somebody, when you've gone through something together with them, you become a loaf. And look what he sees. There's a loaf of barley bread. And it came tumbling in the camp of Midian. It came up and struck it so it fell. It turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. That's what happened to Jericho. The walls lay flat. His companion answered and said, this, now look at this. I love it when the enemy gives you the word of the Lord. It's one thing for you to give me a word. But if my enemy tells me, I'm done. Look at the enemy says. His companion answered and said, This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has delivered Midian and all the camp into his hand. Now when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for Adonai has given into your hand the camp of Midian. The battle is going to be won by 300 people who became one with Gideon. Whatever Gideon did, Judges 7, 11, he said, whatever I do, you do. They were in unison. James 4 says this. He says, if we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee. Deuteronomy 28 says, the Lord will cause your enemies to be smitten before you. They shall come against you one way, and they shall flee seven ways. Five shall chase a hundred. A hundred shall chase ten thousand. The shofar, along with the unity, everybody say unity, along with the unity of the 300, released a sound that caused the enemy to be in panic, in confusion. You know why the rabbis say with the blowing of the shofar brings confusion to Satan? Because Judges chapter 7 says when they blew the shofar, the enemy turned on himself. He panicked. He went into confusion. Get a shofar. The shofar with the unity of the 300 caused a sound of that enemy to be confusion. The enemy's strength was flatlined. 
Wouldn't you love the enemy's strength to be flatlined? You business people, aren't you tired of fighting for every deal and then you get the deal and then before it closes, something happens, Jeremy? Amen? You take three steps forward and 2.78 steps backward and you go, why did I even show up? It happens when you blow the shofar. So there's a specific Hebrew word for blowing the shofar that caused Jericho's walls to fall down flat. There's, there's Amalekites and there's the Midianites and they joined as one. Midian means strife. Amalek means the people are the king. It's the people's king. So how do you get the strife out and how do you get the lie that it's with the, whatever the people say is the king is the king? You get it through this blowing of the shofar. And in Hebrew, it's a specific blowing called the taka. And the taka is where we get the sound tekiah from. The ketiah, long blast of the shofar, uninterrupted sound comes from this word. Look what, to, to look what, betakad. The root means, uh, it's a root word, means to clatter, to slap the hands together, to clang an instrument by analogy. I love this. To drive a nail or tent pin, a dart, this is Yael, by implication to become bondsman by hands clasping, to blow a trumpet, to cast, to clap, to fasten, to pitch, tent, to smite, which is kill, to sound, to strike, surtiship, and to thrust. The King James translates this word 46 times, you say, blow, it means to fasten, to strike, to pitch, to trust, to clap, sound it, to cast. This is a word used in Psalms 150 as a praise. You can use the shofar, the taka or the tekia is a praise, but it's not just a praise. It's also a weapon that brings down the enemy's strongholds. A related word, Strong's 8630, is takaf, and it's a root word related. It's related to taka, related to tekiah. The root word means to overpower. The related word, it means to prevail against. So when the shofars are blown, it oh, it's an overcomer. It's an overcoming. It's a prevailing. It's a causing confusion to the enemy. So then in Numbers chapter 10, it talks about two different sounds. It talks about the taka, and it talks about the terua. And both of them... Some, uh, and in Numbers chapter 10, many times they're used together. You have the taka and you have the teruah. Sometimes it's used, okay, get up, it's time to start marching. Other times it's like, all right, you need to go this direction right now. Look at teruah. Look what teruah. Teruah is a clamor. An acclamation of joy or a battle cry, especially a clangor of trumpets as an alarm, an alarm, a blowing of the trumpets, a joy, a jubilee, a loud noise, a rejoicing, a shouting, a high joyful sounding. So the tekiah is, all, the, the rabbis all agree, the tekiah is a long, uninterrupted sound. It's like, enemy, you messed with the. But then the teruah is a staccato of nine blasts. Nine short blasts, if you will. Now look in Numbers 10. Look what it says. 
When you are at war in your land against an aggressor who attacks you, this makes no sense. This is what you're going to do. I mean, really, God? This is what I'm going to do. So remember, first the natural, then the spiritual. If you are in spiritual warfare, if you feel what I'm feeling right now, try it. Get your shofar out and blow it. Because look what it says. When you're at war in your land against an aggressor, who's the aggressor? Who attacks you, you shall make teruah with your trumpets that you may be remembered before Adonai, your God, and be delivered from your enemies. What if God says, not if, he's saying it. When you blow the shofar, I'm remembering my covenant with you. I'm remembering my child is under attack of the enemy. And if you mess with my child, you're messing with the apple of my eye. They are written on the palm of my hand. But you blow the shofar. You let God know, God, I need your heavenly wind. I need your sound. You're going to mirror what's going to happen in the heavens. Look in 10, Numbers 10.10. 10. Now, Jeremiah, and you might want to get ready to do some teruahs and tekiahs tonight, today as we close the service. Numbers 10.10. 10. Look at this. And on your joyous occasions, your fixed festivals, your new moon days, you know, we have Shavuot coming up on uh, a week from Tuesday. I want everybody to be there. Listen, you don't have to register. Just show up. The registration is for people who are not family. Your family, you're part of the house. Just show up. I'm just letting you know. It's going to be an amazing time. And on your joyous occasions, on your fixed festivals and your new moons, Thursday night, we do this, right? You shall taka. That's the long sound, the tekia, the trumpets over your burnt offerings and your sacrifices uh, or your peace offerings of well-being. I love that translation. Wholeness. They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am Adonai. I am your God. Both, you've got both words. The trua and the taka or the tekia. The shofar trumpets will cause God to remember his covenant and deliver the Israelite. The shofar seems to be some type of supernatural weapon. I've heard people make fun. And I was like, Lord, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. I know they have no understanding of this supernatural spiritual weapon because if they did, they would not mock it. Look at Joshua 6, 6, 16. On the seventh round, look what happened. The seventh round as the priests blew the horns, Joshua commanded the people, make the teruah. Break the, make the, where's Irene? Make the Tarua. So look what he says. When they did that, can, I don't know, if, can you imagine, just imagine this. You get, God, God gives instructions, all right, this is the first city. By the way, everything is off limits to you. Anything you do get, it has to go into the temple treasury. All right, well, you know, it's first city, first fruits, okay, we get that. Here's the strategy. Six days... Seven priests, the ark of God is going forth. They're going to blow the shofars. They're going to circle around the city one time for six days. And to make matters worse, you can't talk, make a noise until the day I bid you shout. 
Now, I'm going to, to me, I get this. I don't say I can do it because my wife says my mouth just like. Burr, burr, burr. Some of you quiet people, you might have a shot. I don't really know many of you but because you don't talk, but that's. <laughs> if you had that instruction. And on the seventh day, by the way, seventh day, we're going around the city seven times. So here's what you're getting to do. For six days, all you get to do is hear the shofars, because the priests are going to blow the shofars, and you're going to look at these walls. And you can't talk, because if God let you talk, you would trash talk. Not the enemy. You would trash talk your people and say, God, really? This is ridiculous. Um, how is this going to work? So we're going to march. We don't have a, we have no weapons. We have these little shofars. We got, we, instead of the army in front, we got our priests in the front, the ark in the front. This is why God says, shut up and march. Can anybody get a hint today? Stop trash talking your own peeps. Shut up and march. It's if faith never makes sense. Obedience doesn't make sense. But on the seventh time, what happened? Joshua said, now shout for the Lord has given you the city. What happened? All those people had been in unity for seven days. It's a mirror of this counting the Omer for 50 days. Seven days. Then the last day, seven times. Four, and then blow the shofar. Shout. If you didn't talk for seven days. Verse 6, verse 20. So the people... The people made the teruah when the horns were sounded. And when the people heard the sound of the horns, the people raised a mighty teruah and the wall collapsed. To me, this is telling me something. It was not just the people's voice. It was not just the people's shofar. That sound could not be enough to, if you look at some of the models that they show you of these walls, big enough to have chariot races on top of, 40 foot high from the ground. I don't care how loud that army got and not talking for seven days, something got behind their shofar on earth and God released a sound and a voice and a wind and they went up and they crossed into that place that said, you can't go here. Don't mess with us. You, this wall's never coming down. So let's make these declarations today together. Are you ready? This ain't, this ain't for, this, what do you call it? This not for kids. Don't try this at, no. <laughs> and maybe as we, as we, as the Lord leads, maybe we have an altar call, we'll declare the tekiah and the trua and that every wall, every fortification of the enemy that's saying, don't even try it. Give up. Look at, I can so, say so much, but I'm just going to just go ahead and do this. Our declaration today, let's say it together. May we be uncomfortable in the natural, but comfortable in the spirit. May we be uncomfortable in doubt and unbelief, but comfortable in faith and trust in God. May we be uncomfortable in rebellion, stubbornness, or apathy, but comfortable in faithful obedience. May we be uncomfortable in compromise, but comfortable in covenant commitment. May we 
be uncomfortable in Egypt and Babylon, but comfortable in your Hebrew identity. May we be uncomfortable in fear, but comfortable in God's security. May we be uncomfortable in sin, but comfortable in righteousness. May we be uncomfortable in lies, but comfortable in Torah truth. May we be uncomfortable in strife, but comfortable in peace. May we be uncomfortable in not keeping or making Shabbat and feast days a first priority above all other days. May we be uncomfortable in the presence of profanity and worldliness. May we be uncomfortable when you are being marginalized and not celebrated as a child of royalty. May we be uncomfortable when you are unequally yoked in any way. May we be uncomfortable when the land and people of Israel are cursed and threatened. May we be comfortable when your thoughts, mind, and desires of the soul and flesh don't align in obedience and authority to the Word and the Spirit. May we be uncomfortable in the natural, but comfortable in the Spirit. Let's all stand for the Shema. Amen. Let it be so. Shema Yisroel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Malkuto Le'olam Voed In English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And you shall love Adonai, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words which I'm commanding you today are to be upon your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children. Speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontless between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Go ahead, let's, let's make sure they, everyone has the, the communion today. Father, we just worship you. Lord, we thank you today that strongholds are coming down. Every layered fortification, every lie, every attachment, anything rooted in the demonic realm is being rooted out of my life, out of my family, out of my home. I declare healing and wholeness. I declare signs, wonders, and miracles. Lord, let the sound of your heavenly shofar be heard in this place. Let those walls fall down flat. Let the enemy's strongholds flatline. We declare, we decree, no weapon form shall prosper. We declare those strongholds coming down for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, to bringing every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. Lord, may every lie, every untruth, every distorted fact, every soulish or fleshly attachment rooted in the demonic be pulled down like those altars that Gideon pulled down, the altars of Baal, the false husband altar comes down, the sexual uh, spirit of Asherah comes down in the name of Yeshua. We Find the strong man. We spoil his house. Lord, we declare we will put nothing wicked before our eyes. We ascend to the high places. And I want you to see yourself going like Gideon at the nighttime. I want you to see yourself taking care of those familiar spirits that were passed down from generation to generation. It had gotten to Gideon, and Gideon had, had put up with it. And then he realized that the reason 
the enemy had his way is because Israel had not been obedient. They had not obeyed. And Gideon said, Lord, what am I to do? He says, tonight go get the right sacrifice ready and get ready to pull down the spirit of Gideon's here. I believe it's cutting down. It's hewing down the altars of Baal and Asheroth over you, over your family. And it's going to be a, a, a way for the legacy of Yeshua, the legacy of blessing to flow into your family. The next generations won't have to fight those devils. So prophetically, we climb up that mountain. Just do it right now. Lord, prophetically, I'm climbing that mountain. I'm climbing it, and I've got ready to offer up the good sacrifice. I'm getting ready to offer up the sin offering because it, it's Yeshua. Yeshua, you have paid the price for my sin. Lord, it was your blood that took care of my rebellion, my stubbornness, my apathy. But before that new altar could be built, Gideon had to go up to that place, that high place. Lord, may we ascend. May we ascend with that sound of the teruah. May we ascend with the sound of the tekiah. May we hear that heavenly sound, that heavenly wind blowing and giving us the power and the strength to tear down the things that have been standing in so strong. See yourself See yourself ascending. See that altar of Baal cut down. See, you're doing it. Prophetic. You know what the real prophet's anointing is? It's not a nice, simple prophecy. It's not edification and just comfort. The book of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah is called as a prophet, he says, Jeremiah, I've ordained you as a prophet to the nations. You're going to root out. You're going to cut down. You're going to pull up. You're going to throw down. And then you're going to plant. Then you're going to, you want to know what the true prophetic will do? The true prophetic's not going to leave things there. Because if you leave it there, You'll never move forward. There will always be something. Who can identify with this today? Anybody? Jeremiah, I want you to blow this. Blow it. Blow it. As the Holy Spirit leads you, blow it. Blow it. Blow it. Come up front here. Come up front. Blow it over this congregation. Blow it over. Blow the teruah. Blow the tekiah. Lord, let the sound release release a, a wind. Release a strength that causes every stronghold, every strategy of the enemy to be pulled out, to be plucked out, to be thrown down, to be crushed, to be forever nothing. Flatlined. Hallelujah. I see it. I see it for you. I see it. I see it for you. I don't want to embarrass anyone. I won't call your names, but I see it. I see it. I see it. I want to call your names, but I can't. I don't want to embarrass it, but I see prophetically. We're stepping, we're stepping into something this Shavuot. We're stepping into something. You're stepping into something. I don't want you to be comfortable Business is not, it's not as usual. Business people, it's not as usual. Family people, it's not going to be as usual. Nothing's going to be as usual. Everything is changing. And, it, and remember, as we have dealt with some of these strongholds today, we dealt with them in the spirit. But the moment Gideon took down those strongholds. 
that's when the enemy really gathered. You get that? But it's a smoke screen. It's not, they're not going to be able to do anything. They're gathering for their end and they're gathering for your new beginning. Seven years Israel couldn't reap the harvest because the Midianites came in and stole their harvest. Prophetically, the Lord's saying, this will be the season for you to eat. This will be the season for you to enjoy the blessing. It's not going to get stolen this time. It's not because the strongholds are being dealt with. And don't let it end with this service. If you got a shofar at home, start blowing it. Go into your, their rooms. You know what I'm talking about. Go into their rooms when they're not home and blow the tekiah, blow the terua. The voice, the wind, they're going to get an app, they're going to get apprehended. Let's seal it. Let's seal it. Go ahead. I have to bring it to the COVID. I had a dear friend. They're ministers. They preach all over. Harry and Cheryl Salem. He was on his deathbed. He's in the hospital. They said to him, there's nothing we can do. You got two hours. His wife, Cheryl, is a mighty woman of God. And this was during the COVID when people were dropping like flies and they lived in California. So you already know. She got her shofar. And she contacted. I was online and she said, I'm standing outside of the hospital and she had her ladies and they were blowing the shofar saying live Harry Salem live Harry Salem live he went four hours six hours he's now preaching the gospel with her all over and it was because she took a step of faith and blew the shofar in a place where they were not happy about it they were telling her to get off the property. She said, oh no, I'm blowing the shofar. And I, Pastor Ken and I, when we were watching it, I had my shofar and I'm blowing. People all over the United States are blowing the shofar and he lives today. So what he's preaching you is it happened. I have friends. So whatever's happening in your life, if you have that shofar, do it, blow it and do it in, by faith because it brings confusion to the enemy and life to us. I just had to share that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Over the cup. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam Borei peri hagafen Amen. Lord of God, King of the universe who has given us the fruit from the vine and the precious blood of the lamb. Let's take the cup. Wow. I'm getting revelation as I'm standing here. <laughs> like, oh, my Lord. Hold up that bread. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, hamotzi lechem min haoret. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brought forth the bread from the earth and the bread from heaven. Let's take the bread. Yeshua, we thank you for our Hebrew food. We thank you we will live and not die and declare the work and the word of the Lord. Bless your inheritance, Lord, as we go today. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, amen, amen. If you want special prayer, you want us to blow the shofars over.